Chapter Ten of the Story of a New Zealand River by Jane Mander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten. When Alice began to make peace with Asia the next morning, she was prepared neither for the easy forgiveness and forgetfulness of the tragedy of the day before, nor for the torrent of questions that was the result of the emotional intimacy of that reconciliation. She was conscious that day that something was wrong with her method and for the first time she longed to talk it over with somebody and she knew that somebody meant david bruce she had awakened that morning thinking of him and of his words to her the night before she knew now that she had to see him and to talk to him that he could help her to straighten out some of the perplexities of her thinking that winter and she wondered why it suddenly seemed to be all right but as the day wore on and the possibility of her seeing him that evening became more insistent excitement welled up at her again and her pet bogey the beginning rose to frighten her she knew that if she longed to see him so much it was not right to see him at all but temptation kindly removed itself from her for a few days when roland returned from the bush that evening he made a fuss about some important paper he had forgotten to get from roos and alice learned that as the latter would not be down for some days her husband would have to make a special trip back to get it this left her alone to deal with Asia, and her questions as best she might. And, in the course of those few days, she was appalled at the distance the child's mind had travelled, and hurt to find out that she had talked freely to others. In a moment of illumination, she saw that this was the result of her own actions. Whenever Asia had begun to be inconveniently inquisitive, she had declared she had a headache, that she mustn't be worried, and she had thought by this means to stifle or divert that lively imagination and that vigorous curiosity asia was indeed a revelation to her mother she had been quick to turn from alice's headaches to david bruce who never seemed to have headaches when she wanted to talk to him and to bob hargraves who had no scruples whatever about churning up her young mind and to other men about the bay who were amused at her naive questions she had pastored them all as to their views on god and the angels she had collected their opinions on the subjects of what people ate in heaven whether they wore clothes or not, whether they slept in beds, whether they were so strong that their legs and arms would not break, whether God really heard your prayers, what he really did to the wicked, and so on, and she had puzzled herself into a fever over the variety of their answers. It was from the socialist carpenter working on the beach that she first learned that there was no God, that nobody really believed in him, and that it did not matter whether there was a God or not, because people had to live just the same and be nice and kind to one another, that the greatest thing in the world was to be liked, and that if you were kind you were liked, and that if you were nasty you were not. As for hell, he successfully convinced her that no god of love could ever have thought of such a place for a minute. It was when she asked him if she was to believe him instead of her mother that the carpenter saw he might get into trouble for talking to her. So he tried to explain that people had different opinions, but that some people did not like to hear about anything but their own, and so he asked her not to tell her mother what he had said. This troubled her so much that she had asked Bruce about it. He gave the carpenter and Bob Hargraves and others a hint that they had better leave her education to the people appointed to educate her. But he had difficulties with her himself. Do you believe God lives up in the sky? she had asked him. I haven't seen him, but lots of people think he is there, he replied but she was not to be put off. Do you believe he is there? she persisted. I don't know, he answered truthfully. Do you say your prayers? she asked. I pray in a different way, he evaded. But this only started more questions. And so it was that when she got this chance to begin on her mother, she was a questioner experienced by considerable practice, mystified by the variety of opinion and stimulated by something that was almost a conspiracy to keep her from the things she wanted to know god seemed a safe and simple topic but they had not proceeded far with him before alice found herself in a hopeless mess mother do you really believe god lives up in the sky they were all out in the garden the second afternoon betty and mabel playing in a big box and alice and asia trying to dig a plot for vegetables my dear you know i do why do you ask I've always taught you that God lives in the sky. Does he see us now? Yes, he always sees us. I've told you that before. 
does he know we want to have a nice lot of vegetables of course he does then why does he let the worms eat the seeds that isn't kind well they won't eat them all and they have to live on something alice thought this was satisfactory but she saw that asia was turning it over in her mind she could not understand why the child no longer believed her you are not digging very well you must go deeper than that she said hoping to divert her attention she had discovered that action and a new occupation were fine antidotes to asia's mental restlessness she had also learned that they might be a good thing for her own and for that reason she had been glad to learn to garden when she heard that mrs brayton did a good deal of digging alice decided that she could dig a little too and as soon as her husband had got her and asia light spades and other garden tools they had begun to work out of doors whenever the days were fine and now they had a few spring plants and rows of sprouting vegetables but along with these joys they had discovered the sorrow of worms and asia had developed an extraordinary vindictiveness for the predatory insects that destroyed the seeds and buds her mother had been amazed once to see her stamp with exalted fury upon a snail which she called a villain and a thief telling it that now she had got it she would show it no mercy and giving a sigh of satisfaction when she saw its pulpy remains mixed with the earth indeed snails and worms had had a good deal to do with asia's speculations about god mother she said leaning upon her little spade if i was god and could make nice things i'd never make nasty ones i wouldn't make snails and worms to eat up the flowers but they do good in other ways said alice but why should they do bad things god could have made them all good my dear alice tried to be patient we do not know his reasons i do not know them any more than you do but i believe that it will be all right and we shall know some day but i want to know now it won't be any use to know when we are dead alice stared at her startled by this truth she wondered if the child understood what she was saying or whether she was repeating something she had heard this thought had occurred to her several times lately but just then she caught sight of mrs brayton coming down the field and asia flew to meet her the old lady had her arms full of spring flowers and two books of short stories by w w jacobs she greeted alice with a spontaneity that hid no secret reference to any tragedy in the past and they immediately began a discussion of the garden mrs brayton praised asia's plot for which she had brought a parcel of young plants and she gave alice hints as to the care of seeds and the best way to rake and hoe then they went in for tea and music the next evening as asia threw out the tea leaves something in the spring night caught her oh mother the stars are so wonderful come out and look they stood some minutes looking at them mother do play red indians with me just for a little while it's such a long time since you had time to play very well smiled alice just for a few minutes get my cloak roland sat over his everlasting figures in the sitting-room beside a fire alice knew the babies were asleep and that she could go out without being missed asia got a board and a box for them to sit upon and with an air of mystery and suppressed excitement that amazed alice she led the way to a maori pit that bruce had told her was the remains of an old fortification there were several of them along the top of the cliffs now mother we'll be good indians and the bad ones will come up the river to burn our homes we must lie down and watch for them quick cause indians can see in the dark and when the fish jump that's the sound of their canoes they don't make any sound if they're careful but tonight they'll be careless cause they think we are away quick now mother or they'll see us wildly excited she dropped down into the pit almost pulling her mother off her feet we're safe she whispered now listen and be ready to shoot like this see and she went up her hands pointing in imitation alice was astonished at the vividness of the child's imagination at the seriousness of her play at this transformation from her ordinary self or what alice took to be her ordinary self when a fish jumped she fired with an assumption of nerve and bravery then she heard the screams of sinking indians and what was still more unlike herself she exulted in their destruction in ten minutes they had won a great battle single-handed against innumerable foes and then the thrill of the fight passed and their safety secured asia dropped back panting beside her mother she lay still for a minute or two then she drew up her knees pressing her chin into them her hair fell about her face so that alice looking at her sideways could see only the tip of her nose with a pang at her heart 
the mother felt that the child had come in the last few months to live in a world of her own from which if she did not take care she would soon be shut out mother asia turned suddenly we've killed hundreds of bad indians we have not really but suppose we had do you think they will all go to hell bad indians have to be punished like bad white people alice answered hoping the questions were not going to begin again mother is there really any hell mr bruce doesn't believe there is any for a moment alice felt the resentment she had felt before that any one but herself should direct the thought of her child there are people who don't believe in hell but there must be a place where bad people are punished she replied uncomfortably as she peered through the starlight at her mother i can understand why bad people should be punished but i don't understand why they have to go on being punished nobody goes on beating all the time down here if betty is naughty in the morning you don't slap her all day and all night and on for ever and i don't believe a good god would either mr bruce wouldn't he told me he's kinder than god startled afresh alice looked away from her and down upon the star-spotted river sheen below it was bad enough to be thinking something of this kind herself but to have her doubts put into the hard form of words by her child was worse at asia's age she herself had been a clod to be moulded as her elders pleased she had never doubted the things she had been told she had never heard any other point of view she had been too carefully sheltered asia she said sadly determined not to be angry with her you have been talking about things that only i should tell you and so you are getting mixed up you must not ask other people questions but i want to know things mother i must know then you can ask me asia waited a minute or two are you sure you know mother she asked alice began to get impatient i know just as well as anybody else and it is the duty of children to believe what their parents tell them you are forgetting all the things i have taught you asia thought a few minutes you told me god answers our prayers mother when we pray for what is right yes he does not answer mine then you have prayed for foolish things no i haven't i have prayed a long long time that you wouldn't have any more babies and now mrs jones says you are going to have another what alice sprang into a tense position oh mother don't be angry why do you get angry oh oh alice burst into helpless tears of shame and humiliation for the moment she wished she were dead there seemed to be no end to her sufferings mother what have i done whimpered asia i don't want you to have any more babies i can't help it i don't oh asia alice turned to her with a passionate burst of grief that hurt the child as much as anger you are going to make me ill you will kill me if you go on like this you must stop talking to anybody anybody but mr bruce do you hear me her voice rose i will not allow you to go anywhere where did you see that woman mrs jones tell me at once where did you see her she was in the store this morning i heard her tell another woman asia was sobbing now herself alice clenched her hands to keep herself from screaming oh how horrible she gasped to herself how could she know i haven't told anyone it must have been just suspicion vile creatures she wondered if her husband could possibly have guessed and told her she knew he talked with what was to her disgusting familiarity mother don't be angry pleaded asia asia i don't know what i will do if you go on talking to people you used to be so good you did as i told you now you don't seem to care whether you make me unhappy or not oh i do mother then listen to me you stop listening to anybody or talking to anybody when i send you to the store these people are not like us and they have no business to know anything about us or to talk about us now will you remember that all right mother can't i talk to mr hargraves no cried alice furiously not to anybody asia sobbed in perplexity but i like him she moaned i can't help that you must do as i tell you all right mother said the child with an air of resignation i won't talk to anybody any more but how did mrs jones know you were going to have a baby can't you stop it mother oh asia alice sprang to her feet go inside i cannot talk to you any more tonight go inside don't be frightened i'm not angry with you but i want to be alone go to bed 
she burst into tears again asia sobbed bitterly as she got to her feet i don't understand why you are crying i don't understand will you tell me mother alice looked helplessly at her it never occurred to her to soothe her with the truth and she was totally unprepared for such a situation with the sort of lies that might have been effective what to do with a child who would think and who wanted real reasons she did not know she only felt that such precocity was almost unhealthy asia was no longer merely her child she had become a problem as well i can't talk to you to-night she repeated but go in and go to bed and do stop thinking you are not old enough to think for yourself now kiss me good-night i am not angry with you now but the grief was just as inexplicable to asia as the anger she went sobbing inside and sobbing she undressed and got into bed to puzzle about it for hours before she fell asleep no sooner had she begun to develop a feeling for the world as a glorious plaything than this other sense of fearful things lurking just out of view began to oppress her along with the revelation of adventure in the boy's own had come the mystery of babies and the still greater mystery of the things one must not say after asia had left her alice walked blindly down to the beach and began to pace up and down the hard sand border between the pebbles and the mud bared by the low tide she was too distracted to cry any more oh god what am i to do what am i to do she groaned she looked up at the stars was he there that comforter that she had sought so often and believed in so unquestioningly in the past that prop she so badly needed she felt she did not have to visualize him she only had to feel him as a presence if he was all round her she ought to be able to feel him there when she needed him as she did now and if she could not feel him what use was he oh god where are you i want to know now she said and then she remembered she was echoing asia's words she stood as if expecting that sign that all men look for in those desperate moments when doubt gathering strength gets its final throttling grip upon blind faith but she saw nothing but the hard starlight the black bush the spotted leaden channel of the river she felt nothing but the chill air the pervading desolation of the swamp lands and the hills struck by a sudden fear she sat down on a gnarled root of a pahutakawa which spread its naughty and grotesque shape like the clutch of a demon hand far out on to the beach if there were no god to help her who would and what did her life mean could she go on living without god without any knowledge of him could she make the sacrifices suppose there were no heaven no reward what would keep her a decent person what would guide her in her daily life what had guided her but the hope of a future life with its justice and rewards how could she face life without that hope what was she to tell her child how did people live who did not believe in god she knew there were those that did not she had heard great names ingersoll radlaw etc but she had always vaguely thought that there was some special dispensation to deal with great geniuses and the heathen she had given god credit for some powers of discrimination but she had always believed that the average person had to have god in order to be decent she didn't see how without him people would be decent the fact that belief in god had not improved the lives of many people she knew had never affected her belief in him her father had taught her that one should not condemn good kerosene because it got dirty in a dirty lamp and she had accepted the illustration as all-embracing she supposed that everybody she knew believed in god but as she sat there she began to wonder how many of them really did she wondered if david bruce did her thoughts went back to asia and the outrageous mrs jones and a fit of anger shook her again she did not know how she was going to live in such a place with such people and with such experiences she could not bear to be talked about her reserve and sense of aloofness from anything she did not like amounted to a mania she thought it was necessary to the preservation of her own personality that she should wall herself off from those who had not her own sense of taste platitudes such as you can't touch pitch without getting soiled had the force of gospel truth for her she thought it dreadful that asia should even see such a person as she supposed mrs jones to be when her feeling had spent itself she began to think she saw that if she continued to worry as she had done in the past months she would become a nervous wreck 
she knew that even if there were no god no heaven no justice anywhere she would still have to live on here by the river feed and clothe her husband and her children have more children keep her house clean do certain things and not do certain things and it would not matter what she believed the porridge must be well boiled or her family would get indigestion this came to her with the strength and clearness of a pronouncement from the skies but she realized that it did not come from the skies though she was far from believing that it did not matter what she believed she now made the discovery that no matter what she believed there were certain ways in which she being herself must act and she saw too that in order to act in those imperative ways she must learn to protect herself from the violence of her own feeling but like a child in the dark she craved for the light if it was not to come from heaven she would have to look for it elsewhere she felt that david bruce could help her she wanted something to justify her desire to know him she told herself that it was part of his work as a doctor to advise his patients and that she could without any disloyalty to her husband turn to bruce for spiritual advice she did not see that what she really wanted was emotional satisfaction sex satisfaction by proxy she would have indignantly denied any suggestion of that i don't care if there is a god or not she said at last half fearfully as she got up i have a right to have that man for my friend she was a little afraid as she looked up at the stars but no thunderbolt or lightning shaft shot out of the sky upon her the probable loss of god in his heaven might have disturbed her much more if her thoughts had not turned to the final comforter of all women whether they spurn it intellectually or not a son of man uncertain still but glad to know that david bruce was something she really could see and hear she walked home End of chapter ten chapter eleven of the story of a new zealand river by jane mander this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven it will take me two weeks perhaps three i've told bruce to look in he will be down to-night now there's no necessity for you to be nervous he or bob hargraves can sleep here everybody will know why they're doing it and nobody is going to gossip about you and if they do they can't hurt you roland sat on his horse prepared to start for auckland he had been called away by telegram the next afternoon as he spoke he went through his leather satchel to see that he had not forgotten anything oh my cheque-book i must have left it in the brown coat pocket he said fidgeting alice hurried in to get it he was thinking of something else when she handed it to him so he forgot to thank her well good-bye he said lightly stooping to kiss her perfunctorily and waving his hand to asia at the kitchen window he rode off an hour later alice stood in front of what she called her wardrobe wondering which of two dresses she should put on she flushed guiltily knowing this hesitancy was due to the fact that she wanted to look as nice as she could she knew she had no business to dress for any man but her husband then she told herself she was silly and that there was no question of dressing up she wore the navy blue cloth dress and the grey cashmere dress alternately they were both plain and they both suited her but still there was something to choose between them there were times when she looked better in the grey if she had a good colour for example and she had a good colour now and she knew she was likely to have it all the evening she tried to quiet her rising excitement as she put on the grey dress it had long loose lines of the utmost simplicity through which her figure showed soft and rounded it had no collar but there was only the suggestion of a v in the neck after some hesitancy alice arranged her best bit of old lace round her throat and pinned it with a sapphire brooch the finest bit of old jewellery that she possessed then she was afraid that asia might ask her why she did not wear these things oftener the thought worried her she unpinned the brooch and removed the lace but finally she put them on again thinking that as the child knew nothing of bruce's possible visit she would not connect the two events when she was finished alice looked at herself in the glass she knew she was attractive even beautiful but for years now she had taken little comfort from the knowledge her fine grey eyes whose expression had always been somewhat remote from the humanity at her feet had grown harder and still more unresponsive she saw the suggestion of lines about her straight features which the girls in the select school she had attended in her youth had called statuesque 
and grecian but her skin was as fine and as clear as ever and her chestnut hair was full of dancing lights she drew back startled as she realized where her thoughts were leading her the worst thing that could happen would be for david bruce to see that she was beautiful and to proceed as most men proceeded under the stress of that knowledge she wanted his friendship and she knew she needed it very badly but if it were not forthcoming simply because she was a woman she must not bargain for it with her looks then she remembered that his helpfulness had not ceased because he had seen her in the most unbecoming of clothes and in the most unattractive of domestic settings as a matter of fact he had never given a sign that he was conscious of her looks he had been exactly what she pretended she wanted why then was she dressing up for him now she was considering this when asia called to tell her that the children's tea was ready after the babies were put to bed alice and asia sat down to their own meal they had had some further talk that morning when alice had told the child that she really did want a baby boy and that that was the reason why she was going to have another baby but that it was only their business and that other people ought not to speak about it and she said mrs jones could not know but that she had only guessed it she was relieved to see that asia was diverted by the idea of the baby's being a boy and that she started at once to find names for him and to plan out the fun she would have with him oblivious of the fact that he would not be able to play in her fashion for a long time to come it was after eight o'clock and they were both sitting by the front room fire when alice sat up suddenly hearing steps outside asia there's somebody coming you stay here she got up as she spoke and as the knock sounded at the back door she went out to the kitchen trying to calm the sudden leap of her heart into her throat it's david bruce mrs roland he called at once please come in she answered as she lit the candle her nervousness mysteriously left her as she looked at him what it was about him that took charge of her and made her feel like a child she did not know bruce had on his old tailored suit a soft white shirt with a low collar and a plain long navy tie he looked easy and comfortable and he entered the kitchen as if he had left it only the hour before well how are your nerves he asked smiling down upon her this simple question so much to the point surprised her she did not know what she had expected him to say she had wondered reviewing the past what he would say and she had been afraid of the humiliation and embarrassment she was sure she would feel i i don't know she confessed wondering if he would just naturally stay or whether she had to ask him to stay and exactly what her husband had said to him well are you starting at every sound and looking for faces at the window alice found herself actually smiling back at him oh no i don't think so no i'm not as bad as all that then she remembered that if she did not appear to be nervous he might not stay that confused her but she was saved by asia who bounded out from the sitting-room it's only mr bruce mother she pleaded catching alice's forbidding look and of course he's nobody to notice he said mischievously his eyes twinkling alice could not help laughing nervously and laughing her eyes met his she knew she could not resist his boyish lightness asia seized his hand oh you are cold she said can't he get warm mother bruce turned his dancing eyes upon alice you don't have to say yes unless you want to but a quick light flashed across her eyes please come to the fire she stammered awkwardly not seeing how absurdly she was putting it boisterously dragged by asia he followed alice into the front room and sat down opposite her in the glow of the logs this is lovely cried asia joyously as she flopped on the mat between them now you tell us stories mr bruce tell us about julius caesar i love him my dear gasped alice do be quiet mr bruce may not want to tell stories and besides it's time you went to bed although alice was growing excited now at the thought of being alone with him she knew it had to come and she wanted it over as soon as possible oh no mother it's quite early asia drooped to the verge of tears alice did not wish to show that she wanted to be alone with him she had hoped that would come about naturally can't i hear one story pleaded the child look here young lady broke in bruce i have come here to see how your mother is getting along and i can tell you stories some other time i want to talk to her to-night oh dear she said sadly then a gay thought struck her are you going to stay all night you can sleep in my bed i won't mind 
she did not understand why he laughed suddenly or why her mother turned to look into the fire why should i stay all night he asked returning to gravity why she thought a minute we must have a man to take care of us and father has gone away yes but you know it might not be convenient to your mother to have me to stay you should have found that out before you asked me there might not be enough for breakfast oh but i know there's plenty there's porridge and we can make lots and there's bread and butter she stopped for now bruce had dropped his head in his hands and her mother was laughing helplessly why are you laughing she demanded bruce raised his face alice looked at him and away again leaving him to deal with the situation look here you don't see that perhaps your mother does not want me to stay at all there could be lots of reasons why she does not but now that you have asked me you make it very hard for her not to ask me to stay because she would not want to hurt my feelings by showing me that she does not want me and so before you asked me you should have found out whether she would like me to stay or not a strange man in the house is a lot of trouble he's not like a member of the family your mother might want to stay in bed in the morning but if i were here she would feel that she would have to get up do you see though she kept her face turned to the fire alice listened breathlessly i see said asia slowly but you are not a strange man and i can look after you and you get your own breakfast and make your own bed you told me at last alice turned to speak but bruce waved his hand at her with a smile wait a bit he said just as if he had been assisting her to deal with asia all his life i'm going to make her see it if i can listen he took one of asia's hands you want me to stay and because you want me to stay you think your mother wants me to stay and you also think i want to stay but you are thinking only of yourself you're not really being unselfish and this is your mother's house not yours now don't you see that you can't decide for us you don't really know what we want to do and that is why children should wait for older people to say what they want to do oh dear she said pathetically mustn't i ever want you to do anything oh yes he smiled but you had better whisper it in our ears first to see if it is all right she turned instantly to alice to take him literally and seeing it coming they both collapsed oh lord he groaned i congratulate you on having remained sane whether it was because she had laughed little for months or because the relief from strain was so relaxing alice laughed out as she had not done that winter feeling that they were making fun of her asia was deeply hurt i think you are nasty she choked then her mother turned to her my dear i wish you would remember what mr bruce has said but it is all right for him to stay to-night if he wants to she looked at him blushing and adding quickly and if he can spare the time to look after us certainly interrupted bruce promptly but i wish you would remember that this is not your house and that father and i are the ones to ask people to come she is always asking people to come and stay she looked explainingly at bruce naturally he smiled children are so interested in everybody and everything and exclusiveness isn't an instinct it's a cultivated precaution oh but she wanted him to uphold her it's impossible to have them well they all understand that don't they did any of them ever come she looked rather uncomfortably into his amused eyes seeing that she was foolish asia you must really go to bed now say good night to mr bruce piteously disappointed the child held out her hand may i kiss mr bruce mother she whispered her face lighting up as this idea came to her you certainly may answered alice hoarsely asia fastened herself upon him as if she meant to stay there for ever and he was about to disengage her when she jumped up struck by another idea mother i haven't an uncle couldn't mr bruce be my uncle my dear alice laughed suddenly meeting his quizzical eyes perhaps mr bruce would not like that oh dear there i am again she exclaimed mournfully seeing that she had forgotten the teaching of the evening i can't remember it's too hard why would you like me to be your uncle he asked solemnly oh it would be so nice and then you see if you were my uncle you would be a member of the family and you could come often and stay and you wouldn't be a bother oh do please asia did not know that her simple proposal was to create an attitude of mind that would extend beyond the house on the cliffs and be accepted as a matter of course in the years to come as a relation that went unquestioned 
how far it affected the consciousness of either bruce or alice at that moment neither could have said but they both had a feeling about it well answered bruce as if he were considering a weighty proposition it's a responsibility but perhaps i can live up to it uncle david it sounds benevolent domestic respectable by all means let me be uncle david it will be good for me but he remembered alice your mother oh yes please she interrupted him halfway between laughter and tears all right he smiled to asia i will be your uncle david oh how lovely and she fell upon him vigorously to bed he whispered disengaging her arms regretfully she went out and for some time they heard her fussing about in the back before she returned to be waved abruptly by her mother into the front bedroom erratic flames from the log fire spurted short-lived lights over alice's piano along the floor and about the furniture apart from the sounds made by asia there was nothing to break the silence of the night outside it was a heavy silence threatening rain and it brought the hills and the forest nearer but it also added to the cheerfulness of the fire and the security of the little room alice sat up a little straighter in her rocker outwardly composed and determined to behave naturally her anticipatory feelings now seemed absurd to her as she looked at david bruce's face turning towards her he had come to her that evening with a knowledge of her difficulties that would have astonished her though he did not pretend to understand her or any woman in detail he knew that to her inbred mental deviousness the knots of the feminine mind were added the deadly ramifications of puritanism and the scotch temperament since seeing her the night of asia's disappearance his thoughts had turned seriously to her for he saw he would now have to deal with her in a more personal way he had wandered about the bush one night considering the elements of the situation he remembered the look of fear and fascination on her face the night he had walked into her room to put some kick into her the fact that she never met him naturally even though he had ignored the convenient past and he considered the something that had arrested him at their last meeting when her reserves had broken down bruce knew without vanity that as a doctor he appealed to the emotional side of women he knew that as a man he attracted them he knew that in any situation where he had to deal intimately with a woman he had to reckon with these two possibilities he was something of a sex psychologist and he had learned how to minimize emotionalism in others but he knew that in order to treat them successfully he had to remain dispassionate himself the unknown quantity in this situation he saw to be himself he knew alice attracted and interested him but he felt sure he would know how to deal with any situation that was likely to arise the fact that he had not been in love with any woman for ten years had rather dimmed his impressions of the devastations of that kind of fever but even while asia dominated the scene between them bruce had been conscious of alice's heightened color of her aliveness of the softness and delicacy of her renewed maternity he had noticed the lace and the brooch as things he had not seen her wear before and he had wondered if they had any significance beyond that of the ordinary feminine desire to dress up for a man his eyes were smiling as they turned from asia's retreating form to alice what a child he said lightly but she is a bit of a responsibility isn't she yes indeed she was grateful to him for this easy opening i'm afraid i don't quite know what to do with her she looked humbly into the fire she's grown so old and she seems to me to be too precocious isn't it unhealthy she looked at him appealingly unhealthy his eyes twinkled at her why she's the healthiest child i ever saw she actually thinks i know that's often inconvenient and embarrassing but it's perfectly healthy she could not help smiling in spite of what she thought she ought to be feeling her spirits were rising to respond to the magnetism of his presence well she may amuse other people but at times she is a trial to me this was a good deal of a confession as he saw perhaps you can help me she added i think i can he leaned forward a little talking half to the fire and half to her you know if you will pardon my saying it god and the angels are not enough for an intelligent child like that they are too abstract and they feed only the emotions and then they are rather troublesome when it comes to being exact don't you think and children demand exactness things they can see and handle does she know anything about arithmetic 
But, she interrupted breathlessly, wouldn't you teach children about God? Why, certainly more or less is a fairy tale, and I would give them arithmetic as an antidote. A child like Asia needs arithmetic and other things that are useful on this earth. Are you going to send her to school? To Kaiwaka? Oh, no. It is too far, and... She paused, ashamed to add what was in her mind about the country children not being good enough for her child to associate with. I teach her a little. She can read very well, and she practices music an hour every day. He looked at her as she sat up primly in her chair and wondered if she really thought that that was enough to fit Asia to grow up and meet the New Zealand world. What do you mean her to be? he asked curiously. Why? She looked worried by this question. I don't know, but it is too soon to think about it. You are wrong, he said quietly. That's the mistake that has always been made about girls. But it won't do for this age or this country. Do you really think that child can grow up to meet life on adventure stories false to life, on religious tract stories false to life, on the Bible, a collection of legends with no more revelation in them than those of the Maoris, compiled like every other story and rumor. That's true. You don't really live by them yourself. None of these things will teach your child to meet a real situation any more than they have taught you. Blind faith does not stimulate emotion. And there is a place for emotion. He smiled at his own preachiness. But it has contributed nothing to self-preservation, which is the strongest law that rules this world. He did not know that she was startled because he was putting into words the things that had disturbed her most that very week. I don't mean any disrespect to your faith, he went on, but we need more than faith to deal with this world. We need knowledge, and we cannot begin too soon to give knowledge to our children. We have given it to our boys, but we have left our girls to traditional notions about religion and love with disastrous results. Seeing that these last words disturbed her, he went on, I could teach Asia some things, if you will allow me. Geography, arithmetic, history, perhaps some French. Mrs. Brayton has hosts of old books that would do, and it would not take much time to set the lessons. She would do the work with very little incentive. She would soon cease to be a problem. I should like to do it. Alice looked dumbly into his face. In a minute, emotion had her by the throat. But, but I can't trouble you, she stammered. After all, you've done... Her voice broke, and he saw her lips begin to quiver. Then she plunged. Oh, Mr. Bruce, I don't know what to say to you. I can't explain. I have been all wrong. I don't know what you must think of me. It was a dreadful mistake. She paused, for in the face of his smile, words seemed so foolish. Let's be thankful it was a mistake, he said cheerfully. It would have been so much worse if I had really deserved all those things you were thinking of me. She could only stare at him amazed that the past could be illuminated because he laughed at it she wondered what it was that gave him the power to dominate a situation to take the difficult stuff of hard words and elusive human currents and make of them an atmosphere of ease and simplicity don't you mind that i was rude to you she asked surprised into asking the thing she wanted most to know at that minute bruce drew himself up dropping his bantering manner he knew quite well that they could not go on without a frank straightening out of the difficulties between them. If people are rude to me, he said gravely, I ask myself some questions. First, do they know what rudeness is? Second, are they deliberately rude? Third, why are they rude to me in particular? Now, I know that you know what rudeness is, therefore, I can't excuse you on the score of ignorance or lack of sensibility. He smiled, seeing she was listening in astonishment to this dispassionate analysis. But I do not believe you were deliberately rude. That is, I believe you were trapped by an unfamiliar situation into a wrong beginning. And unfortunately, wrong beginnings have a sad tendency to perpetuate themselves. Their vitality is distressing. Behind you I saw British pride, with which I am familiar. I admit I was annoyed with you sometimes, especially when you brought needless suffering on yourself. But I was never really hurt by you. She looked at him, unable to say anything. Nobody had ever talked to her with this directness before. She did not know how to meet it. Bruce knew he had not offended her. Well, he smiled. She was fascinated by his leisurely manner. Mr. Bruce, I don't know what to say to you. I have never met anyone like you before. He liked this simple statement. And in what way am I unique? 
he asked mischievously. Why? She thought a minute. You don't seem to notice anything. You don't seem to be hurt. Why should one be hurt? It's a great mistake to let people hurt us. We put a terrible power into their hands. Why should we give them that power? What right have they to it? And they would never have it if we did not give it to them. She remembered these words as one of the philosophical landmarks of her life. Oh, if only I could feel that, she burst out. Everything hurts me. Then she flushed at this confession. I know, he said gently, and it's one of the first things I want to help you to get over. He drew himself up in Tom Rowland's armchair again, for his body had a habit of sliding down and seeking comfort that was not to be had in that cushionless article. His informal movements arrested Alice. You are not comfortable, she said. He smiled at her, hesitating between the truth and the polite lie. May I smoke? he asked, realizing what it was he really wanted. Oh, certainly. Pardon me for not thinking of it. She watched him take out his pipe and tobacco pouch. There had been a time when she thought smoking disgusting, but she had become accustomed to the habit to the extent that she tolerated it. She felt up to this moment, however, that no gentleman would smoke a pipe in her presence. But she realized, as she watched him take the tobacco out of his pouch and roll it, that she might have to reconstruct her ideas of what a gentleman might do. Bruce had been so accustomed to smoking with Mrs. Brayton, who smoked with him, that he had his pipe filled before he remembered that Roland smoked only mild cigarettes, and that but seldom. Oh, pardon me. He looked quickly at her. I forgot for the moment that your husband does not smoke a pipe. That does not matter. I don't mind. I wish you would, please. But he felt the suggestion of a concession in her manner. Now, now, he shook his finger at her, as if she were a child. Are you speaking the truth? She blushed furiously. I thought not. His eyes twinkled again. Now look here. Bruce had acquired many colonial informalities of speech. Now that I am Uncle David and a member of the family, I am going to scold you, so sit up and take it like a man. I shall smoke, since you are willing to allow me, for then I shall lecture you much more pleasantly. She had to smile at him, though a little surge of excitement thrilled up in her. Bruce lit his pipe and puffed for a few seconds, careful to keep the smoke away from her. Mrs. Rowland, he began with more gravity, I wish you always to speak the truth to me. I don't allow people to lie to me. Why, Mr. Bruce, she exclaimed, astonished. Now you're going to tell me that you always do speak the truth, and I'm going to tell you that you don't. You lie every day of your life in manner, in thought, in action, if not in actual words. We all do. We deny the facts of life. We refuse to see them, to believe them, if they're pointed out to us. And even if we see them, we say we don't. We say what we think is advisable, not what we suspect may be true. In fact, Mrs. Rowland, you and all women of your type, are the most frequent liars in the world, and I will prove it to you in the course of time. But all I want you to begin with is that you must not lie to me. It is unnecessary, because I know you are lying. I have heard just the same kind of lies over and over again. Every doctor has. He saw that she was more startled than hurt by his words, that in fact she was not hurt at all. Well, he said, smiling again. A spark of controversial fire flickered in her eyes. Will you always speak the truth to me? she asked. Certainly not. Why? she demanded. Because you could not bear it. She drew herself up in her chair. What do you mean? She was stung into a determination to show that she could bear it. But he continued to smile at her. Just what I say. You could not bear it. Few people can bear the truth. What they always take to be the truth is that which concerns other people, some remote abstraction, but bring the truth about themselves, their own families, their own friends, to their notice, and they will not believe it, or believing it, they will go to pieces, fall ill, become hysterical, go mad, commit suicide, deny their gods, and all the good in life. Mr. Bruce, in what way can I not bear the truth? What is there you know? She broke off, flushing, thinking of Mrs. Lyman. He thought of her, too, but he deliberately ignored it. Oh, now don't be alarmed. But you see, you are alarmed. Now you don't like the truth that your child Asia doesn't believe the things you tell her to believe. There, wasn't I right? He knew he had caught her. You were taught that children must believe what they are told. You have never tried to find out if children really do believe what they are told. Why they ought to believe what they are told. When they ought to leave off believing what they are told, or anything about it. 
you think that because your child thinks for herself she is unhealthy you think that what is true for you must be true for her how do you know it has to be alice stared at him startled by the truth of his words and the revelation of his knowledge of her i don't know she answered helplessly looking away from him into the fire then she looked back but there must be something true i must teach her what i think true certainly but don't be alarmed because she begins to find truth for herself he puffed on contentedly but she persisted there's only one thing true about anything ah there we have it again he interrupted the old bogey the absolute truth of course it troubles you but you see who is to decide what is true a gray day is depressing you and restful to me what is a gray day it is two things it is one thing to you another to me there is no absolute truth about it he pulled himself up in his chair again then how can we decide about anything we decide as we feel he smiled at her you think not perhaps not always at once but finally yes and our feelings train our beliefs we have a nice example to hand have you always approved of smoking she could not help smiling no she replied do you approve it now she hesitated i don't mind it she evaded do you like men to smoke a pipe in your presence he went on i i haven't thought oh yes you have you have had decided opinions about it now you can't deceive me out with it she looked into his laughing eyes her submerged sense of humour rising to respond i have thought that no gentleman would do it she said bruce threw up his head laughing delightedly do you think so now he demanded she blushed looking at him and away again do you he repeated no she answered very low bruce saw that she had suddenly plunged into emotion but intent on conveying his idea he ignored it for the moment there he exclaimed triumphantly in ten minutes you have modified if not changed a belief that you have held for years why simply because your feeling suddenly told you to reject the old belief you will allow me to smoke you will actually begin to approve of my smoking you will insist on my smoking because you like me because you think you had been horrid to me because you feel you have to be nice to me and because you feel these things about me smoking will cease to be a sin or a bad habit to you now what is the truth about smoking is it what you used to feel or what you feel now or what you're going to feel again she brought her eyes back to his face she had been carried on by his words from the emotional reason for her change to its intellectual significance the revelation in his last words was something of a shock to her why i never thought of it that way she said slowly it's a good thing to think of everything that way he answered there was silence for some seconds while he smoked and she looked into the fire which had begun to die down alice leaned down to take up a piece of wood don't make it up for me said bruce leaning to take the block from her i must get to bed when i finished my pipe i'll have to start pretty early in the morning the sudden change of affairs of daily life made her more conscious of their bodily nearness and their common isolation from the world outside what time would you like breakfast she asked hurriedly you needn't think about breakfast he smiled remembering asia's words i'll go to the kitchen you will do nothing of the kind pardon me but i will we will begin as we are likely to go on this is a business arrangement not a social pastime if it is going to be any trouble to you it will defeat some of its own ends i have to go up to the bush to-morrow and i must leave here about five o'clock now you know i'm not going to have you get up at that hour to get my breakfast especially when i can get it at the kitchen you are not going to stand on ceremony with me now that i am uncle david alice thought that she had never seen eyes that smiled as his did bruce knocked the ashes out of his pipe put it away in his pocket and leaned towards her he had to raise his face as she was sitting up very straight you are not going to be afraid of me any more are you he asked simply she was instantly startled into lying why mr bruce i but she stopped seeing where she was going her face fell in confusion see that he said quietly your first impulse is to lie now you have been afraid of me i don't know why and you need not tell me why but there is no reason why you should keep it up he sat up again leaning back in his chair while she sat nervously twitching her hands and looking into the coals mrs roland i think that before anything else i am a doctor and i see most people as children i can't help it 
i have looked so often into the helpless and frightened and appealing eyes of the sick and the dying that my whole attitude to people is coloured with the knowledge i have seen there the general loneliness the common fears they're all the same they differ only in degree and when i see people i see their troubles i often ignore them but i see them and i have learned that troubles can be marvellously minimized by taking them out and looking at them it's the first thing i have set out to teach people i want you to learn to talk to me you don't do it easily at first because you don't know how to but you will learn here are you and i we shall be much thrown together in this place i shall have to be your doctor because mount won't come here now that i am here because i can help i shall have to help you in many ways it is inevitable in a place like this it will be accepted by everyone without question there is no reason why you should not accept it i want you to know that you can send for me at any hour of the day or night for any reason whatsoever nervousness loneliness anything at all and be sure that i shall understand and that i shall never misunderstand bruce knew that for some seconds she had been crying silently he leaned down talking into the fire now i know that a good many things are troubling you because a good many things trouble everybody we are all worried about religion about our children about fears of poverty or illness about the behavior of the people we care about but if we shut these things up within ourselves we add fuel to their fire and in the end they burn us up if we can compare notes with someone else it is often a help we find out that we have no monopoly over sorrow you would be surprised if you knew the tragedies that there are here within a radius of twenty miles of you while you think yourself the most ill-used person in the place he stopped his voice had grown a little tired towards the end alice turned towards him not caring now whether he saw her cry oh she choked i don't know what is the matter with me why there is nothing the matter with you he said lightly but your absurd tendency to make trouble for yourself nobody else wants to make it for you there is no conspiracy of evil around you most people will do their best for you if you will let them their results may not always please you but at least they will mean well nothing can hurt you but your own attitude of mind you have good health good looks you can make people like you what else matters but if you don't take care you can wreck your health you can poison your mind you can make yourself everlastingly miserable quite easily now you will have to choose sooner or later as the evangelists say why not now he smiled at her seeing that her eyes were shining with a mixture of emotions he had deliberately ignored several elements in her situation giving her what he thought was most useful he knew he had talked like a christian scientist or an ism of some kind but he knew she would depend for a long time to come on some ism or other well will you think of what i've said to you he asked you'll find it useful he stood up mechanically alice got to her feet her eyes dry again i will think about it you have helped me more than i can say she looked into his face and for a second all that she felt about him flashed from her eyes that's good and now mrs roland you can cease to worry about anything even about that child that's coming now don't blush and don't look away from me what is the matter with you women you each act as if you were the only person who ever had a child who knew how a child was born or why it was born you each act as if no man could possibly know that children are born or as if it were a disgraceful thing for them to know you each act as if it really were a shameful thing to have a child or as if nature were disgusting in her processes neither of which things are true it may be tragic to have a child it may be unfortunate it may be unwise but it is never disgraceful and for you to blush about it to me who have already nursed you why don't you see how silly it is in spite of her confusion she had to look at him and the real impatience in his eyes cured her his look was so impersonal that she saw that she was to him in that moment only a case and that her emotionalism was ridiculous mr bruce i will try but i can't be different all at once she said rather pathetically instantly his face and manner changed and his eyes lit up it's too bad of me to scold you he said in tones that were like a caress but i do want you to see that you cannot be foolish with me i don't allow it now i shall be down about the same time tomorrow night and if you want any help during the day send for bob hargraves he's a decent chap you can trust him he moved from the fireplace alice following him she was less certain of herself when he was not talking to her more vividly conscious of him the more she was aware of their being alone 
but she noticed that he seemed oblivious of it. I must get you a candle, she said, and you would like some supper. I would like a glass of milk, thank you, if you have it to spare. He stood by the door while she found a candle in the kitchen and lit it. While she got a glass and poured out some milk for him, his eyes roved round the room, but he was fully aware that she was making of the simple service something in the nature of a reverential ceremony. Does the roof leak there? he asked, his eyes upon a corner. Yes. She looked up at it. Well, I'll fix that some evening. You remind me. You see, as Uncle David, I can be made use of in all sorts of ways. Their eyes met, and for once hers responded spontaneously to the mischief in his. He too thought that if she only knew how attractive she looked when she smiled, she would do so oftener. I shall certainly make use of you, she said. Do. That's what I'm for. And I'm presuming you'll stay nervous, Mrs. Rowland. If you developed Amazonian courage, my presence here would be superfluous. He meant nothing by that observation, but it raised a quick excitement in her, and she thought more of it afterwards than of anything else he had said. But at the time she replied with a nervous little laugh that she was only too likely to stay as she was. He drank the milk and took the candle from her, looking as he did so to the fireplace. You have wood in. Is there anything I can do? Nothing more, thank you, she said, with an eloquent emphasis, but he ignored her warmer manner. All right, good night. I hope you will sleep well. He held out his hand, gave hers a quick, strong grip, with no suggestion of lingering, and turned from her into Asia's room, where he was to sleep, and shut the door. Alice closed the center door behind her as she returned to the front room, leaving him shut off in the back of the house. She could not go to bed at once. She knew she would not sleep. She sat down to think over the things he had said, and how he had looked as he had said them. She knew it was the most extraordinary talk she had ever had with anyone, and not at all what she had expected. She knew it had been managed by him, and that he had taken her in hand and cut out her emotionalism. But the thing she most wanted to know was whether he understood the cause of her emotionalism. But she could not tell from his manner whether it meant anything special to him to sit there with her. She did not know if he had noticed what she had on or what she looked like. And yet she had been vividly aware of every line on his tanned face, of the thickness of the black brows over his deep-set eyes that lit up and twinkled like those of a child, of his straight nose and mouth, his thin cheeks and chin, of his fine black hair, and of the droop of his head when at rest. She had been conscious, but less clearly so, of his movements, his easy strength, the sweep of his big hands. As she went over what he had said, she found no disturbing suggestion in it, save in the one light remark about her Amazonian courage. But after turning that over for some time, she decided there was no barb of innuendo in it. He had offered her the one thing she told herself she wanted, a prop and it did not seem to matter to her whether she grew to love him in secret or not, if only they could go on like that. And she believed they could go on like that because he looked like it. She told herself that if she could just love him it would be a relief. She would want no return. It would be a delicious joy just to have him stand by her, to be always there, her friend, and yet, mingled with her new peace of mind, was a curious regret, an insistent curiosity to know whether he thought of her at all. She finally went to bed and fell asleep, thinking more of this than of his advice and philosophy. When he had heard her close the center door, Bruce noiselessly stole out to pick up the small bag he had left in the yard, and in again. He stopped in the course of undressing to stare at nothing on the floor. God, she's not going to fall in love with me. Will that help her or will it not? How the devil am I to know? Ought I to go away? She will have to have somebody. Might as well be me. Then he knew he did not want to go away. He took up the whole of the next evening, mending the kitchen ceiling, with Asia, in a flurry of helpfulness, handing him tools. He also fixed a loose handle on the cupboard door, and promised to put up another shelf in the porch, when Asia said they needed it badly. In a week's time, Bruce had established several precedents, and had reduced Alice to a simplicity that she would have thought incredible a month before. He ignored the way she looked at him, and treated her one or two expressions of feeling in such a matter-of-fact manner that she was well on the way to a calm acceptance of their friendship, outwardly at least. He refused to be drawn into lengthy soul explanations, amazing her by his indifference to a future life or to the great subject of right and wrong. Mr. Bruce, how do you get on without God? she had asked him one night. Well, as you see, 
he said, stretching his feet comfortably towards the fire. She looked into his amused eyes for some minutes, considering this answer. By the time the boss returned, David Bruce had given her a good deal to think about, but he realized she had not got much farther than an exchange of gods. End of chapter 11《she could think of only one thing, the thing that had driven her wild with anxiety all day. They are all right? she asked, still doubting. Yes, really. I've just come to have a look at you. I knew you would be worrying, and I want something hot for the boss. As he spoke, he took off his peaked oilskin cap and undid the straps on his waterproof coat. Alice put down the sewing she had in her hand and came round the table to help him, but he waved her back, for he was too wet to touch. Do take it off and have a cup of tea. I was just going to make some. Are you wet underneath? No, I'm fairly dry. I won't harm. Yes, I can stay a few minutes. She turned from him with an attempt at lightness, and got out the teapot and cups and saucers. Bruce hung his coat on the hook and wiped down his face. Above the howling of the wind, he could hear the voices of the children playing peaceably in Asia's room. Alice saw that he moved stiffly as he walked to the table and dropped into a chair. Although it was not yet four o'clock, night was beginning to close down upon the bay. After eight hours, the storm showed no sign of a break. It was a healthy giant of a storm gone mad. In fierce gusts, it lashed itself against the house, with now and then a lull more sinister than all the racket. With an incessant pelt and patter and swish and hiss, it drove against the windows, through the sashes and underneath the ledges, and spread damp splotches on the lining boards inside. The rain beat through weak places in the roof and dripped with leaden drops into tins Alice had placed to catch it. With each blast, the linoleums heaved up on the roughly fitted floors. The doors strained on their hinges. The whole place rocked alarmingly on its wooden blocks, and the zinc roofing rasped against its heavy nails. As Bruce sat down, something shrieked in the wind with a sound that scraped the lining of the ears, and a piece of spouting, wrenched by a gust, carried away and beat a short tattoo against the wall before breaking off to be blown against the fence he gave one glance round before looking at alice's startled face spouting he said reassuringly don't be frightened the house won't blow down i hope it won't david that really would be the end of everything though she tried to smile he knew she was not far off tears this third winter had been the worst they were ever to know twice before during storms the booms had broken in critical moments and the logs had been swept for miles up and down the river banks, to be recovered only after weeks of search and patient manipulation of high tides. Also, a dam in the bush had been wrecked, and the tramways broken up. Roland had worked two shifts of men to repair the damage, and to try to keep pace with his orders. At the same time, he had planned a mill of his own, to be begun with the spring. He now had shipments of machinery on the way from England and America. He had everything he possessed mortgaged, he had borrowed to his limit, and he owed a number of his men three months' wages. The booms, which stretched from the beach below the house, right across the river, were now packed with logs, ready to fill the largest order the boss had ever had from the Wairoa, and the tug steamers were due to tow them away. Bruce knew how desperately the boss needed the money, and that if the booms broke again and the shipment was delayed, it would be a crippling blow from which he might never recover. Bruce had watched him that day, as he had recklessly jumped hour after hour from log to log, straining his eyes for signs of a break, and muttering at intervals, If this damn thing busts, I'm done. Bruce also knew that, though Roland had carried himself pluckily enough that winter in public, he had used to the full what he supposed was his right to work off steam on his family. There had been occasions when his inflamed nerves had snapped, even in the presence of the foreman. There had been an anxious and hushed air about the house all the winter. 
Bruce saw that both Alice and Asia hailed his every appearance with looks of relief that were more eloquent than words, and as he knew Roland never resented his presence, he had made the most of his privileges as Uncle David, and he acted as a buffer between the opposing nerves of the strained household. But he knew they had all reached almost the limit of endurance, and as he looked at Alice now, knowing, though she had not spoken of it, how it was with her again, he felt love and pity for her surge through him afresh. Her face became less anxious as she made the tea. He saw she would try to be light, so that he might have a diverting moment. When he rose to place a chair for her, she waved him down. Don't get up, please. You look too tired to move. I suppose you have not sat down all day. He smiled. No, one doesn't on those booms. The anxiety came back to her face as she sat down. David, do you think they'll hold? He realized as he looked into her eyes, hard with sleeplessness, how much it now hurt him to see her suffer. My dear girl, as he took his cup from her, they've held all day and we haven't found a weak spot. We've doubled every outside chain and two men are standing by every post and wedge. We have half the bush forced down to go on tonight and not a man has balked on the job. They're good for the night if they're needed. Now I think we'll weather it. Try not to worry. Impulsively, he held out his hand across the table and without a word, she put hers into it. Though they had done this before in crises, without too significant emotion, they both now felt a sweep forward, something akin to the storm that reveled in its strength to toss the world about outside. After a minute he gave her a quick strong grip, and then began to drink his tea. Where is Asia? he asked, just missing her. Oh, she's milking. What? Why, Bob would have done that. I know, but she wanted to. She has been pining to get out all day. You know she loves storms. She smiled grimly. The children good? He questioned, as if he owned them. Yes, for a wonder. He ate rapidly for a few minutes. Could you get me a couple of sandwiches for Tom and a hot bottle of tea? I must go. While she got them ready, he vulgarly stuffed bread and butter and cold meat as fast as he could into his mouth, making no apologies. Then walking to the back door, he strapped himself into his oilskins. With a bottle of tea and the package of sandwiches, Alice walked over to him and put them into his big pockets. Then, as she looked up at him, he felt as if something swept out of her to clutch his soul. David, is it very dangerous on the booms? There was no diffidence in her voice or in her eyes. Well, it's a risk if one is not very careful. He saw what was coming. Have you been there all day? Yes. Promise me you won't go on them again. As she spoke, she stretched out her hands to him. As he seized them, he saw her through a mist. He hesitated only a second. I promise, he said hoarsely. And then, taking up one of her hands, he kissed it and crushed it against his cheek. Swept off her feet, she swayed towards him, but in a flash of clear-sightedness, Bruce saw that they must not lose their heads. He put an arm around her shoulders and held her firmly, but made no attempt to move or kiss her. As they stood like that, they could hear the beating of their own hearts above the roar of the storm. Bruce deliberately extended the time of his hold upon her, knowing that he was giving her a memory to help her through the night. When at last he drew away from her, he took her face between his hands and looked calmly into her eyes with all the understanding she craved to see, and with all the force of the declaration she had begun to want. She stared back helplessly at him. "'You know I understand,' he said simply. "'That is all that I can say, isn't it?' "'Yes,' she whispered lowering her face. His manner lightened. Now to please me, try to get to rest, and don't worry. She looked up again, her eyes shining. It's all right, David. I can go on, with you to help me. Her voice broke. Cheer up, he smiled. You're not going to lose me. You'll find me as adhesive as a Spanish fly blister. Before she could answer, he stooped and kissed her hair, with a touch so light that she felt only the thrilling suggestion of it and then he was gone through the door into the rapidly gathering dusk. She ran to the front window, and he, seeing her, as he came round the corner, smiled and waved gaily at her, and again when he passed through the gate. Though he had tried to minimize its significance, Bruce knew that this was but the beginning of something whose end he could not see. He knew that to say, stay there, to sex emotions, once started, would be as foolish as to say it to the logs bursting through a tripped dam. He foresaw that the conflicts between the don'ts and the I-musts were likely to be long and troublesome. 
as alice watched him she too felt that what had just happened was inevitable though she told herself that her love for him was entirely spiritual that she never wanted it to be anything else she had craved to know whether he felt anything special for her for two years during which as uncle david he had outwardly preserved the manner of a favored relative he had given her no sign that he was in love with her the friendship had been all that she could have dreamed of the ideal all that was safe for a christian wife and mother and yet she had wanted the sign just the sign she repeated to herself of something more now that she had the sign she knew she did not want it to alter anything she just wanted bruce's love as a beautiful secret to hug to her soul as compensation as food for her starved emotionalism she had ceased to argue about the right and wrong of it so long as it was spiritual she knew she was entitled to it it did not occur to her that david bruce might not be able to keep his love for her on the same plane of exalted spiritualism where she expected hers to abide for ever as she watched him go down the slope in the driving sleet she felt that the terrors of the coming night had been mysteriously lessened that after all even if the booms did burst she could face tom's ruin for the moment the thought of the coming child ceased to trouble her as alice looked back over that long nightmare of a winter she felt she could never have come through sane without david bruce she had had the feared second miscarriage two springs before and then a baby boy now a ferocious little mass of vitality almost a year old one of the worst things she had had to endure that winter had been the eternal restlessness and screeching of this terrible infant which roland had resented as if it had been all planned to annoy him then even before the winter had begun they had faced extreme poverty alice had taken much too seriously her husband's statement that they had only so much a week to live on and that he couldn't go into debt for food thinking all women were naturally extravagant he had given her quite unnecessary warnings about economy and he never noticed the strained literalness with which she carried them out the winter had not progressed very far before bob hargraves put it to bruce one night in the store i say he began it's none of my business but i don't think they're getting fat up there it's been pretty plain feeding this last month and yet at the men's kitchen they are living on all the expensive tinned stuff we can get them bruce who had begun to have his suspicions looked into bob's kind eyes what have they had he asked bob read out so many pounds of oatmeal barley flour sugar and salt that's all no meat no butter no eggs that's all i say bruce hang it all i'm willing to wait a month or two for my screw if they're as pushed as all that and i guess some of the others would too thanks bob that's decent of you i'll find out and it was two or three evenings later that a deputation of men had astonished the boss by telling him they could wait for their wages till spring then bruce had gone to mrs brayton they're actually going hungry he declared wrathfully i find out from asia that she and her mother have been going for six weeks on two meals a day they've had no meat except those fowls you sent their own fowls are being killed one by one for the boss and the children have the bones when he's done with them they get little more than enough butter from the cow for him their vegetables are nearly done and that crazy girl would starve before she'd say a word and she'd starve before roland would see that she was starving god the stupidity of it and things wasting here exclaimed the old lady as furious as he but how are we going to make her take them you know she will think she is an object of charity one step off the workhouse i'll fix it with the boss for god's sake send them down something to-morrow the next day when harold brayton arrived at the house with a sledge alice stared into his non-committal face you say tom ordered them she looked down at the packages yes where shall i put them for you alice kept quiet while he carried in a sack of potatoes a side of bacon and a box containing cheese some pots of honey a bag of dried apples a salted ox tongue a dozen eggs some keg butter for cooking some fresh butter and a pair of fowls all ready to go into the oven but as soon as he had gone she dropped into a chair by the table and burst into tears of humiliation she did not believe her husband had ordered them asia ran in from the back garden looked at the sumptuous array and then at her mother whom she took to be weeping from happiness oh mother don't cry any more let's eat some of it let's have a party i know granny sent it you know her mother sat up 
did you tell her we were poor no mother asia you have told somebody uncle david i see you have i am ashamed of you you know we should keep our troubles to ourselves other people can't feed us but asia was learning wisdom and refused to be upset if they want to mother i don't see why they shouldn't do be sensible and let's have a party but all the party spirit asia was able to coax into her mother was destroyed when roland came home yes i ordered it he said angrily and they'll send stuff every week you didn't have to starve and make me ridiculous in the eyes of everybody all i said was we had to be careful but of course you couldn't get it right you know i've always been careful she replied weeping afresh oh of course you're never wrong and he stamped out of the room it took bruce all his time during the next day or two to restore alice to peace of mind there's no charity in it he protested in answer to a remark of hers it's a business deal everyone lives on a credit system and between your husband and the Braytons, the advantages are theirs. Tom's plans will make Brayton. The township here will mean better roads, a bigger local market, increased price of land, and by and by a weekly steamer and a quick route to Auckland, doubled and trebled prosperity for everyone who lives here, and no one knows it better than the Braytons. If they could not wait for the money for a little dairy produce, it would be a pity. This view of it had comforted Alice, but Bruce had not ended with that. And even if it were charity, you have as much right to live as anyone else. For heaven's sake, my dear girl, bury that damned conscience of yours and get up and kick something. Kick Tom. He needs it. Kick anybody who bothers you. Forget you're a lady. Get rid of your disgusting humility. Don't take everything lying down. Alice had been able to smile at his shots, and much advice in the same strain had helped her to adopt various measures of mental self-defense. She was learning to care less how her husband spoke to her, learning to make more allowance for his nerves. She would have got on still better with her own attitude of mind had it not been that she could get no more sleep than he did, and sleeplessness was her most deadly foe. Bruce suspected much of what she had to put up with, but he did not know everything. Alice turned from the window as she heard the children calling for her in the kitchen, and as she got their supper, Asia came in dripping from head to foot. There won't be a thing left in the garden, she said sadly, putting down the milk pail. Never mind, we will manage. Asia looked at her mother. This cheerful remark was unexpected. Asia was growing lanky, and some of her childish gaiety had been submerged by the sense of responsibility she had developed in the last two years. The buoyancy of her naturally sane and eager temperament was to triumph later over her present riot of seriousness but at twelve years old she was prematurely aged by two great emotions. Alice had no idea of the complexity of Asia's outward natural devotion to David Bruce, or of the depth of her understanding of her mother's tragedy. She never knew how many nights the child sat up in bed, wretched beyond description, at the sounds of Roland's sleeplessness. She had no idea how much she saw and heard, but she did see and rejoice in what she would have called the noble qualities of her child the devotion, the sacrifice, the sense, the usefulness. She could not have managed without her any more than she could without Bruce. And if it could have been possible for her pride in her to have become greater than it was before, it would have increased that winter. Asia began to shed her wet clothes as she stood on the sack. Oh, dear, said Alice, looking into the pail. Is that all she gave? That's all, mother. She was in a bad mood. No wonder, poor thing shut up all day in that little yard. I explained to her, but of course she couldn't understand, and I sang to her, but it was no use. Alice could not help smiling. Well, it can't be helped. You and I will have to go without milk for tea and breakfast. All right. Asia picked up her wet clothes. She wondered all evening why her mother did not seem as anxious about the booms as she had been earlier in the day. As far as she could see, the storm was as bad as ever. They sat up late, Asia reading to her mother while she sewed. After she had gone to bed, Alice stood by the window for some time, staring out into the night. She wished someone would come to tell her how things were going. She wondered more than once if Bruce were keeping his promise. Again, she hated the feeble part of waiting that women had to play in a crisis of this kind. As she caught sight now and then of dim lights moving in the swirl down below her, she could imagine the men fighting for dear life to save the boss's logs with a loyalty that she had learned to value 
she knew they would be swearing and laughing with a recklessness that fascinated her to her it seemed superhuman that they could fight the gale for hour after hour in the cold and wet after a while she began to walk the room restlessly wondering what the future would bring wondering if she and david bruce could keep their beautiful friendship unspotted from the world wondering if she could possibly go on living with tom roland and having his children wondering what would happen if the booms burst at last worn out she threw herself down on the front room sofa covered herself with a rug and fell into a nervous sleep there she still lay when the opening of the back door at three o'clock startled her into a sitting position dazed she jumped up and walked to the kitchen door the booms she muttered staring at her husband and david bruce who were helping each other out of their heavy coats safe said bruce quickly and the storm's gone all at once she realized the sharp stillness safe she repeated stupidly yes yes exclaimed roland impatiently and we're frozen can't you get us something hot while the two men went into the sitting-room to strip and beat warmth back into each other's bodies alice revived the kitchen fire where the night logs soon blazed up before the men were ready she had hot soup and a kettle of boiling water she was wise enough to see that they were beyond answering questions as they staggered out and dropped into chairs while they ate and drank she got hot water bottles and made up a bed for bruce on the sitting-room sofa she had taken the precaution to put the children into asia's room so that there would be no noise to wake her husband in the morning but bruce decided he would go to his shanty and without a chance to look significantly at alice he took one of the hot water bottles and went out more tired than she had ever seen him without a word roland fell into bed to sleep for fourteen hours without a break before alice had cleaned up the mess of wet clothes the first glow of the morning sunrise was blazing a background for pukicararo with a queer vacant feeling now that the strain was over she lay down on the bed she had prepared for bruce and slept lightly till she heard the sounds of the children awake in the back room End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the story of a new zealand river by jane mander this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen bruce was the only man who could not sleep long that morning he had not fallen like the rest of them into a heavy slumber he had merely dozed and tossed feverishly his mind tormented by the vision of alice's hard sleepless eyes and by the struggle he knew was ahead of him complicated for the time being by another of his periodical fits of fever and depression whose only cure seemed to be oblivion he had hoped that the storm and the fatigue might help him to work off for this time at least that horrible urge toward a climax that swamped out his will he had given up arguing with himself about it but he had not given up nor did he intend to give up the fight twice in the last eighteen months he had gone under after struggling to a point where something broke in him he had ridden off to return in a few days with the ghastly sensitiveness of the man who feels that lack of control is the unpardonable sin he had kept away from alice who he knew condemned such lapses and had no understanding of their mental or psychological basis until he had lost all signs of the madness but he always hated meeting her again with that brand upon his soul though he knew it to be disease it did not alter the fact that it was the tragedy of his life and now as he tossed in bed he saw it was coming again unable to rest he got up gave himself a sponge bath and exercised for half an hour to try to take some of the stiffness out of his limbs and to tire the hot aliveness of his mind then he stood for some minutes in his doorway staring up at the cabbage trees more scraggy than ever now that they had lost half of their leaves in the storm looking at his watch he saw that it was half past eight and he wondered if the cook would be ready with something to eat he walked round to the front of his shanty there he stopped short to look at the damage wrought by the storm roofs had suffered everywhere and not a fence had escaped the one that bob hargraves had just put up round his section the nearest to the boss's house was nowhere to be seen catching the wind as it curled round the cliffs it had been scattered in all directions sheets of zinc palings boards tins and cans of every description were littered about between the cottages along the paths among the bushes in the field two brick chimneys had collapsed into shapeless heaps 
and the big zinc one at the kitchen had been twisted as if the demons of the gale had tried to wring its neck further along boats that had been torn from their anchorage lay smashed on the spit or were carried high and dry up the banks timber stacks were levelled and a shed on the spit had been wrecked out of existence but the water of an innocent and peaceful river lapped gently about the boundaries of the great booms every log was safe and sound an unnatural stillness hung heavy over the bay where by day there was now always a constant flow of bustling activity there was not a sound about the cottages or the kitchen hardly a column of smoke from a chimney bruce guessed that every house would be still till the exhausted men awoke looking toward the boss's cottage he saw alice in the yard he knew that the sooner he faced her and continued their normal ways the better with a half-formed thought that she might help him he went to her she took her cue from him and greeted him naturally he looked from her round the devastated yard and at the children and at the baby bunty as asia had nicknamed him tucked under her arm tom he asked asleep thank god he has not waked i fed the children out here and shall keep them out till he wakes they walked to the end of the wash house and looked at what was left of the garden and the fence you didn't sleep long alice was thinking more of him than of the wreckage he did not look at her he was afraid she might guess what he was coming to and he knew she would understand it less than ever following on the incident of last night that like all women she would think that caring for her ought to keep him out of all temptations and revolutionize his natural tendencies no i was overtired but i'll sleep presently where's the cow his eyes sought her in the field she got out in the night asia has gone to look for her she felt that he was shutting himself away from her and she thought he meant to show her that they must not return to any significant expression of their feelings it hurt her that he should think she might become weak and demand any change in their friendship she registered a vow to show him that she could be just as strong as he could have you had any breakfast she asked no they seem to be asleep at the kitchen i'll bring you out some she smiled lightly up at him will you hold bunty i daren't have him inside he took the baby glad to be diverted by him and while tossing him up and down he took stock of the damage in the yard he was glad to see that the wash house had held and that beyond the fence and the spouting there was nothing that could not soon be mended then he went into the shed and sat down by the rough table on which alice put her wash tubs bunty who chewed his thumb contentedly with unusual good humour gazed up into his face in a way that amused and arrested bruce who began to speculate about his future and his unknown possibilities as he did so he heard piteous weeping in the yard startled he jumped up and as he reached the corner of the shed he met asia who raised a streaming utterly hopeless face good god child what is it with his free arm he pulled her back into the wash house something dreadful has happened she choked worse than anything i don't know what we will do tell me he commanded he was more upset than he could have believed possible at the sight of her breakdown the cow is drowned she moaned our dear daisy drowned drowned repeated bruce yes drowned she got out in the night and she was so hungry she went down to eat the mangroves and now she's drowned are you sure he asked a lump now in his own throat yes quite sure she's stuck in the mud i went out and poked her she never moved and her eyes are just awful she's quite dead i know she was heartbroken oh what will we do she sobbed oh child bruce soothed her don't cry any more she isn't hurt now and we will get another cow but we have no money not any at all never mind mr brayton will give us one but it won't be daisy i loved her oh why did she have to die just then alice stood in the doorway with a tray what is it now she cried Shh! bruce held up his hand it's nothing it's only the cow the cow she exclaimed putting down the tray and staring at asia's miserable face yes she's drowned now don't but it was no use for alice asia's breakdown was the last straw she dropped onto the bench beside her crying helplessly oh mother asia threw her arms around her poor daisy it must have hurt her so her eyes are awful bruce looked at them for a minute and then swept by an impulse he could not and did not want to control he dropped bunty on the floor and gathered them both into his arms 
he saw that alice recovered almost immediately he felt the short experimental pressure of her body against his and then she sat still but he could feel excitement working in her he had made his soothing gestures less significant and then as she grew calmer he closed his hand upon her shoulder as he sat thus with asia clinging to him on the other side he thought of tom roland lying inside asleep and beguiled himself for the minute with the bitter humour of the situation alice wondered at the change in his expression and did not understand what there could be in it to amuse him for her the incident was a milestone on the road of emotional experience it would have hurt her badly to feel that it did not mean a great deal to him but she knew that outwardly they must ignore it and she thought the change in his manner was meant to remind her of that fact as she raised her face to his to give him the look she could not resist her eyes fell on the tray and his breakfast fast becoming cold oh david we are selfish returning to her normal manner asia get up dear and have some breakfast with uncle david then she and bruce saw that asia was more in need of comfort than they haunted by the dead daisy's glazed eyes she could not eat but kept sobbing at intervals in a way that wrung bruce's and her mother's hearts to help her they went out and began to clean up the yard and the garden and there they all worked keeping the children quiet and busy till it was time to have another picnic meal outside by the middle of the day the bay began to show signs of life after lunch bruce went to direct the men on odd jobs of straightening out the wreckage then he went up to the braytons for another cow when he got back at five o'clock he found roland had just wakened up delighted to hear that one of the tug steamers was coming up the river for his precious logs half an hour later the spit and the booms were alive with men preparing rafts to be ready for the morning's tide it was eleven o'clock when roland and bruce finally left the captain when they reached the store bruce said he had to get something out of it the boss turned from him ignoring his manner hm he said to himself as he went up the bank poor devil he's got it again but roland wasted no time moralizing about his foreman or judging him or feeling sorry for him he accepted his weakness as something that was there and that was the end of it bruce unlocked the store meaning to get himself some food as he picked out a tin of meat and some jam he startled a mouse and took up a stick to kill it but was not quick enough he moved boxes and bags hunting for it but continued to miss it then forgetting what he had come for he went out locking the door behind him and walked along the bank to the beach below the cliffs he meant to pace that sand till he tired himself out even if he walked all night he was amazed afresh at his own vitality at the heat of the liquid that flowed through his veins he did not try to argue about the good or the bad of it but set himself to fight it but as before his mind grew frenzied in the hopeless struggle against his body the still river and the fresh night did not help him the silence of the hills only mocked his fever he craved for the only thing that could help him to break the weight of the accumulated suppression in him the only thing that could still the beat in his brain he could feel flames licking round the inside of his skull eating up everything in his head he felt them burning through his body galling the nerves in his legs stinging the soles of his feet but he fought on till he thought he was too tired to feel any more climbing round the base of the green hill he picked his way among the rushes behind the boss's house when he reached his shanty however something blazed up in his brain and a hundred nerves snapped through his body the thought of going in and getting calmly into bed was too flat too banal to be endured he knew he would burst if he tried to force it on himself as if pursued he strode to the place where his horse always stood tethered he saddled it mounted and galloped off into the night he only meant to ride and ride and let his horse take him anywhere it would but in less than half an hour it had landed him at the point curtis public house end of chapter thirteen